But we had so many corporations pleading guilty in the 90s that I did this report. The, the 100 top corporate criminals of the 90s just, 90s, just listed them with the amount of the fine and ranked them. These are the top 100. Now it doesn't, you, you rarely see a corporation pleading guilty. Why? Uh, because they came up with these devices to get them out. They don't want to shame the corporation. So to get them out of pleading guilty, they're called non-prosecution agreements, which is what Massey got, uh, deferred prosecution agreements, or pleading guilty to like a defunct sub-entity of the corporation. Number 12, corporations love deferred prosecution agreements. So in the 90s, if there was evidence of a crime, they would bring a criminal charge against the corporation and sometimes against the individual executives and the company would end up pleading guilty. Then the Justice Department said, hey, there's these things called deferred prosecution agreements. You can charge the company and then say, if you're a good boy for two years and don't engage in wrongdoing, we will drop the charges and engage, enter into this deferred prosecution deferred prosecution agreement. The prosecution is deferred for two years. They pay a fine, they get off the hook. Wells Fargo doesn't want to be known as a corporate criminal, despite what it did. And uh, it's an open question. There's going to be, there's an open criminal investigation of the company, and it's an open question whether they or their executives will be criminally prosecuted. New York Times article recently, last week, saying this is going to be the test case. Will the Justice Department actually bring criminal charges against high-ranking executives? Because it's so egregious. It's got so much. They were went in and they opened up accounts without the knowledge of their customers and often forged signatures. So people, it's something people could get their head around. But, it, you know, it used to be when they did these congressional hearings, like we saw last week, they followed it up with real reforms. And Ralph and Joan and the early public interest fighters were part of that. Now it's, it's like grandstanding. You know, you whip the corporation, you get the publicity, and you go home. And, and number 11 is corporations love non-prosecution agreements even more. Because non-prosecution agreement, you don't get charged with a crime. They just, like in Massey, they just say, we're not going to prosecute, you just pay the fine. Uh, and number 10, so if it's a deferred prosecution agreement, a non-prosecution agreement, or uh, number 10, in healthcare fraud cases, if, you, if a company ha admits that it criminally ripped off Medicare, you can't deal with Medicare anymore. So that's like a death sentence. So this is what they do. This, they find a unit of the company that doesn't have any assets, and they they have that company plead guilty. So that company can't do business with Medicare, but that company wasn't doing business with Medicare. Uh, corporate, corporate criminals, number nine, corporate criminals don't like to be put on probation. You know, you and I, we commit a crime, we put on probation after we get out. Oh, they hate it because it actually works. The judge puts, puts a, 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 you know, an officer of the United States government in the corporation to make sure they're not doing anything wrong. That happened with Con Ed about 20 years ago. I think that was the last one for a big company. And they don't like to be charged with homicide. Uh, there used to be a DA in Los Angeles. That was number eight. There used to be a DA in Los Angeles who would investigate every worker death as a homicide and bring some cases. They hate that. They don't want the label of being, you know, it's all about public perception. There are very few career, number seven, there are very few career prosecutors of corporate crime. The reason is the revolving door. They love spinning between the government and defense, defense, defense law firms and back. Uh, there's pluses and minuses to that, but the minus is uh, the undermining of the justice system. Number six, corporate criminals often turn themselves over to the authorities. Most cor big corporate crime cases are driven by these big law firms who come up with the facts, uh, know that there's criminal activity, go to the Justice Department, present the facts, and cut a deal, a deferred non-prosecution agreement. Number five, the market doesn't take most corporate crime prosecution seriously. You know, and when they cut these deals, the, it, when they cut these deals, the uh, stock of the companies goes up because there's no real ramification to it. Uh, number four, 
the Justice Department puts out every year a crime in the United States report, doesn't include corporate crime. And Ralph and others have been calling every year for a corporate crime in the United States report. Number three, when, and I've got one more minute, so this will be really fast. Number three, when corporate criminal sanctions are the most potent weapon um, in a prosecutor's arsenal, look for the whistleblowers. There are these great laws now. So for those of you listening to this out there and you know about corporate criminal wrongdoing, you can get a share of the bounty, usually 30% under the False Claims Act. Great program being set up. The guy who set it up is going to be here of uh, the SEC. Uh, SEC has a similar program. You go to the SEC, you say, here's a crime. If you successfully prosecute it, we'll get a third of it. We need, number two, we need a 911 for corporate crime. Let's call it 611. If you know of a crime, call it. That goes along with the whistleblower. And the one thing you should know, finally, about corporate crime is that this city is in the pocket of the corporate criminals and the corporate criminal lobby. There's a coalition of players, including Public Citizen, the Center for Auto Safety, Taxpayers Against Fraud, and Better Markets that are pushing back sort of the anti-corporate crime lobby. You can join with them if you want to sign up. Thanks very much. Thank you, Russell Mokhyber. You know, Ralph Nader often talks about um, the corporate crime wave besieging the country. Well, there's your evidence. Um, our next speaker, uh, is a senior advisor with Friends of the Earth's nuclear campaign, which works to reduce the risk of nuclear power to the public. He was appointed chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority by President Jimmy Carter in 1977, where he stopped the construction of eight large nuclear power plants and pioneered a massive energy conservation program. He's been general manager of several large public power agencies, including the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the New York Power Authority, and the Sacramento Municipal Utility District. He's the author of several books, including Winning Our Energy Independence, An Energy Insider Shows How. Uh, David Friedman. Energy is the ultimate good news, bad news story in the world. Uh, when the lights go out, everything stops. I mean, it's, it's the magic that keeps our cell phones charged. It's, it's just an invisible everything uh, about our life that we enjoy. Uh, but it's also the two most awesome threats uh, to mankind that exists. Uh, if we don't control atomic energy and uh, stop it from blowing us up, the burning of fossil fuels is creating such a greenhouse effect is to heat this earth up to make it uninhabitable. So what we enjoy the most is the greatest threat to mankind. So listen fairly carefully to what I have to say because with all due respect, all the other issues that are gonna be discussed today and tomorrow and the day after are really not gonna make much difference if we don't uh, stop the awesome threat of the atom bomb, of the atom, and if we don't get off of this poisonous diet that we're on, namely coal, natural gas, and oil. Uh, and if, if we keep on making these speeches about the threat of climate change, but don't fight for the kind of actions that will really uh, reduce it and eliminate it, we're hypocrites, plain and simple. And, and uh, let me be blunt about it. I hold the people that make the speeches about climate change uh, so eloquently and offer uh, nothing much that Mother Nature can notice. I hold them in higher disregard than the dumb folks that just don't believe in the climate science at all. Uh, if you understand the problem and then don't take or even advocate the actions to cure it, 
uh, you got a lot more explaining to be to do than the dumb folks that just don't know what's going on. Now, most of the younger people in this country have forgotten about the nuclear threat, but that doesn't mean it went away. Uh, in the age of terror, uh, we ought to be uh, doubly afraid of radioactive Trojan horses uh, in our midst, which is what the nuclear power plants are. And we have almost forgotten that the nuclear power plant is the path to the bomb. How in the name of heaven do you think North Korea ended up with nuclear bombs? It's that we promised them a nuclear power plant. It, there is no peaceful atom. And once a country, you know, riches uranium, they enrich it a bit more and make bombs. So uh, we've got to go back to recognizing that atomic energy is an awesome threat. The good news is, and I had the pleasure of discussing this with President Carter the other day. We're, we're, I'm 90, he's 91. And we said, we never thought we'd have the joy of living long enough to see solar power cheaper than nuclear power. Well, that's what we have today. So we're out of our cotton-picking minds if we continue uh, with nuclear power with the awesome danger that it poses and the lesson. How can we tell the Iranians not to make a bomb and, and uh, if we continue advocating uh, nuclear power plants? So uh, we just don't have a decent mirror. And then there is the not only the danger of the power plants itself uh, melting down, uh, but they generate waste that after 50 years we hadn't figured out where, what to do with it or where to put it, and it stays radioactive for centuries and centuries and centuries. And uh, there's a moral issue about continuing to make waste that we don't know how to handle. There's only one answer, it's called birth control. We need to stop making it. And uh, we need to bring, uh, bring the nuclear in issue up to the forefront on par with climate change is something that we need to get under control. And the great news is that the modern day Edisons have learned how to harness the sun and harness the wind to where we can do that and actually cheaper the nuclear power or the fossil fuel plants. It, it's kind of breaking my heart to see that on the technical side, we have invented the answer and we don't have the intestinal fortitude or the common sense to override the power of the entrenched industry uh, to require that it be used. And that gets me to my basic point about energy policy. If the threats are even half as awesome as I described them, and they are, is, uh, we have to believe the scientists and we have to understand the nuclear problem. We face these threats to eliminate the one home we have, Mother Earth. Frankly, we don't have the money to send everybody to Mars, and I don't think that if we all went up there, uh, there's resources on Mars to enable us to live. But we don't have any other option. Our only home is not yet burning up, but it's heating up and it's about to catch on fire to the point where it's be uninhabitable if we don't get blown up first. All this is going on and we are relying on the marketplace to solve us. Now give me a break. <laughs> uh, we could pass all the carbon taxes in the world, which we've been trying for 40 years unsuccessfully to pass, and it would not electrify the railroads. It would not require Detroit to start making all greenhouse gas-free uh, motor vehicles, and it wouldn't require the home builders to have a, a greenhouse gas-free home. You know, when a problem is really tough, like, say, getting rid of DDT, we just freaking outlawed it. If we had lead uh, in toys, we didn't have a lead tax. We just outlawed it. Why, in the name of common sense, is not any of the so-called liberals uh, or our president uh, even advocating something as straightforward, as simple, as a one-sentence law? Everything new must be greenhouse gas-free. 
coming. Why are we why are we going to all these indirect measures, kind of hoping that maybe uh, it will happen when the threat is described as the most awesome thing that ever happened? If your family doctor called you up and told you that your kids were eating a poisonous diet and uh, prescribed a different diet, and it really didn't even cost any more, I think 99 out of 100 people would switch diets. Well, that's what we have on our hands. Uh, we, 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 we are po we've got 30 years left, according to the scientists, and they could be wrong one way or the other. 30 years to go down to zero in the use of fossil fuels. Now, you don't need to be an energy expert to figure out that if we reduced fossil fuels 3% a year every year, uh, it would not be that awesome a task. We have the technology to substitute solar, wind, storage. Uh, and if we mandated it happen, uh, it could happen. My, my suggestion is that we pass a law requiring a 3% a year reduction in fossil fuels and to the extent that someone doesn't comply, then they are taxed a large amount of money uh, uh, per unit of carbon uh, by the Internal Revenue Service and it is a non-bypassable tax that the company has to absorb that they can't pass on. The problem with the so-called uh, carbon tax is the people pay. They just pass it, pass it on and it doesn't necessarily uh, require the right behavior. Um, my, my idea would be to require the right behavior and then to the extent that a company doesn't obey, then they have to pay a tax out of the corporate profits. And, and that, now, now I know what you're thinking. All those ideas, Freeman, they sound real good, but they won't pass the Congress. Well, hell, I know that. I mean, nothing will pass the Congress right now. If, if that's the test of what we're for, we're doomed. I mean, there's one sure way of failing, and that's not trying. And Harry Truman didn't think that uh, health care would pass when he first proposed it. I mean, if we don't give the young people uh, an energy policy worth fighting for, what good are we? I, it, it, it might take a, a while to get it passed. It might be that we can get it passed in a number of states first, and then it, it will be shown to be enforceable without hurting anybody. In fact, prices will end up being lower. But unless we give the, the if I might put it this way, the Bernie Sanders folks a, a a energy policy worth fighting for, uh, then it's never going to happen. And we need to stop uh, having a test of what the existing Congress or the existing president will pass. Uh, because this democracy can't function unless we have something worth fighting for, fight for it and get people in Congress and in the White House in the years to come that, that will uh, uh, en enact it. But I think there are enough green states in this country right now that if we got together on a program of saying, no, we're not going to rely on Adam Smith to cure the most awesome problems on earth. We're going to accept the fact that we must start now. You know, the, the politicians will tell you and announce, we have a great goal. In 2050, we're going to do such and such. In 2040, we're going to reduce pollution 40%. Ask them, what are they doing in 2016, in 2017, in 2018? Uh, because the scientists are telling us that we have got to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases on a steady path downward between now and 30 years. And right now, it's still going up. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an applause line to say you're for 100% renewable. Uh, but then the question is, what are we doing to get there? And I say that when something is really important, uh, what do we have a government for? It's to do the things that you can't do individually. If there was ever an issue that required governmental action, uh, it is the climate issue and, and, the, and the nuclear issue. And it's really not that hard. I mean, uh, I think 
we have the luxury of being able to make a transition. So we could pass laws that, in effect, said uh, by 2025, every car made sold in America has to be greenhouse gas free. We could say in a few years, every new building building has to be greenhouse gas free. And the technology is there to make it happen. We know how to make electric cars. We even can make hydrogen fuel cell cars. We know how to put heat pumps in, in buildings and use that renewable electricity to heat our homes. Uh, we sure, the, the Lord, know how to electrify the railroads. They're electrified in, in every country, in the civilized country in the world, but America. But the, the railroads don't have the capital. We need a green bank to finance all this. Money is cheap now. This is the time that we did it. We electrified rural America with 2% loans back in the 30s. A program of a, a green bank and 2% loans would electrify the railroads, would give people the loans to retrofit their homes to become all electric and all renewable. You know, this could create not thousands of jobs, but millions of jobs. And it could be the greatest adventure that this country undertook in a long, long time. But incidentally, it might save our homes from getting burnt up. And that is what is underway now. So uh, my, my, and I know I'm probably speaking to the converted here. And we spend too much of our time talking to each other. I, my, my request to this audience and the people that see this talk is to find somebody that is not concerned and get a hold of them and make them concerned. And every time you see a member of Congress or, or anyone in public life, tell them, our house is on fire, by gosh, and we need to put it out. And uh, the nuclear threat, uh, all it takes is some terrorist stealing a tiny bit of plutonium out of some place in the world and, and blowing up New York City. Uh, the Indian Point nuclear plant, 25 miles from New York City, is a far greater threat to that city than ISIS is. And yet nobody hardly even knows that it exists. Uh, we, we've got to start making this the very highest priority we have, because if we don't, all of our other priorities are really not going to matter. Thank you very much. Thank you, David Freeman, uh, for that humorous yet sobering uh, account of the dangers facing us in climate policy. Uh, our next speaker is a former tax lawyer from Washington, D.C., and a visiting professor at Mount Holyoke College where he taught Winners and Losers, a seminar on U.S. tax policy, as well as a seminar on poverty. He's in the process of preparing materials that will be free online, uh, which, will teach, uh, which will be for high school teachers uh, to teach students about the federal income tax, the federal corporate income tax, and one on Social Security and Medicare. Uh, he is the author of If Americans Really Understood the Income Tax, as well as 10 Tax Questions the Candidates Don't Want You to Ask. John Fox, welcome. Well, thank you very much. First of all, it's really a privilege to be here to hear these marvelous speakers. Uh, so I'm delighted this conference is going on. I want to talk to you this morning about a topic dear to my heart that strikes fear in the hearts of most Americans, taxation. And I want to tell you about talks I've been giving over the last two years, which may lead you to think, John, are, are you really serious? Uh, but I am. Uh, for the last two years, I've been uh, giving talks to high school juniors and seniors in U.S. government and economics classes about how to think about a fair and sensible individual income tax. Okay, now you can smile. But the, the fact is that the teachers find it very useful. They tell me they wouldn't have any idea what to teach, and yet they learn that so much of my talk is relevant to what they do teach. Best of all, they tell me that most of the students, not all of course, but most of the students get it. And the other thing is, it's really fun to do. 
Now, I've been giving these talks because I'm convinced that the dreadfully low level of political dis disc excuse me, discourse and debate about tax issues um, is attributable in good part to the failure of our education system to address it. And this has left the public uh, uninformed and so vulnerable to almost anything that politicians say about it. And I believe this is more than just a major failure in our civics education. I believe it's dangerous. So in the few minutes I have with you, here's what I tell students uh, in the course of an hour. Taxes fund the agencies and operations of the federal government, but they do much more. Federal tax policies help shape who we are as a nation and what we will become. They touch upon nearly every aspect of our lives. Just think about all those provisions in the tax laws. Healthcare, housing, education, jobs and businesses of every kind, marriage, divorce, death, children, childcare, charities, charitable giving, the environment, on and on and on. In my view, except for the US Constitution, federal tax policies collectively represent the most comprehensive expression of American values. Yes, I tell the students, your personal well-being and that of our nation depends upon sound and sensible tax policies. And I tell them, if you pay attention for this one hour, you will know more about tax policies than 99.7% of all Americans. Maybe 99.4%, I'm not sure. So why focus on the individual income tax? For two reasons. First of all, it by far produces the greatest revenue to fund all government programs other than Social Security and Medicare. What about the corporate income tax? No, the individual income tax produces more than four times the amount of the corporate income tax for all sorts of reasons that you can imagine. Uh, secondly, the individual income tax has become something of a monster. An ideal income tax would be reasonably fair, reasonably simple, and economically sound. But our income tax is frequently unfair, unimaginably complicated, as you know, and an excessive drag on the economy. Americans need to understand why and the imperative to fix it. Now, why is it such a monster? Because it attempts poorly in most cases to do much more than collect taxes on our income. Now, while it imposes progressive tax rates that run from 10% up to 39.6%, those tax rates apply only to taxable income. And the fact is, and you don't hear this generally, only about half of all individual income is subject to tax. More than 100, well more than 100 tax breaks shelter the other half of all individual income. And that means that last year, close to $7 trillion of individual income went untaxed. And I did say trillion. And in general, those tax breaks don't make social or economic sense. Now, when I refer to income, I'm referring to any form of economic gain, whether direct, such as salaries or fringe benefits uh, at work, which I will be talking about in a moment. When I refer to a tax break, I'm not talking about the ordinary and necessary expenses that businesses are entitled to in order that they be taxed appropriately on their profits. I'm talking about special relief involving our personal lives unrelated to any trade or business. Now, a fair tenant of a, a basic tenet of a fair tax is one that taxes people in accordance with their ability to pay. And that would mean that people in households of equal size with equal incomes would pay roughly the same. But far too often, our tax burdens depend on our ability to avoid taxes, not on our ability to pay them. You see, under our tax system, you, your actual tax bill, uh, liability, whether you are a winner or loser, depends in good part on the number of tax breaks and the size of those tax breaks uh, that you're entitled to. So here are three principal examples. We'll have winners and losers, uh, and they're somewhat simplified. But winners work for employers who pay all sorts of fringe benefits for them, 
health insurance premiums, life insurance premiums, disability insurance premiums, contributions for child care, and handsome contributions to retirement plans for them. Thousands and thousands of dollars never appear on their tax return, even though you know they have real economic value. The loser works for a, an employer who pays perhaps the same total compensation, but all his salary. So all of it appears on her tax return. Second, a winner owns her own home or his own home, and perhaps a vacation home as well, and deducts the interest on both homes. For example, the, the winner might own a principal residence that, that he bought for 650000 or, or borrowed 650000 and borrowed 350000 for the ski condominium, deducts the interest on that, and also deducts all the property taxes on any number of homes, even five or six vacation homes. The loser rents, rents her house or apartment, and the loser doesn't even get a deduction for any part of that rent. Third, a winner receives a good deal, often, of his income from investments from investments in stocks and mutual funds, which receive a favored tax rate. The loser, she works. Her income is from salary, and all of that income is subject to progressive tax rates. Now, just because it's a tax break doesn't mean it's bad, but it does mean that we ought to ask, why is it there? Who benefits from it? Who doesn't? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? What are the social and economic costs? What are the outcomes? Indeed, most of these tax programs, most of these tax breaks are the equivalent to government programs. They're simply channeled through the tax laws. Now, here's a major difference. If a government program exists, it has a budget, and it must be reviewed annually by the federal government, by the particular congressional committee. Tax breaks have no budget, and they never have to be reviewed unless some committee requires it. Notice the relationship between tax breaks and tax rates. The more income that escapes taxation, the higher tax rates have to be for everyone. Simple example, if the government needs to raise $20 of revenue for every $100 of income, a flat 20% rate would suffice if all $100 were eligible for the tax. But if only half of our income, $50, is subject to tax, you need a rate of 40%. So, this is so important because the vast majority of tax breaks provide the greatest ta tax savings for people with the highest income. Let me demonstrate this with two major examples. And these are things that we take for granted and we all tend to believe in them. Health insurance premiums paid at work. Um, as so many of you know, those premiums, no matter how high for the most Cadillac of all policies, are not subject to income tax or social security tax. Even though they are clearly a form of income, you know that if the employer paid you that amount of money and you pay the insurance company, it would be the same economic result. But they're off the charts. They never, no matter how large, appear on your tax returns. So listen to this. Over the next five years, uh, estimates are that something like $740 billion of tax savings will result from the exclusion just of health insurance premiums at work. Now that's a big program. And I think we should be asking who benefits most from it, who doesn't benefit, and what are the other costs? Well, the math is simple, and this is something the students get right away. For every $1,000 of, of premiums that are not going to be taxed, if you would have been taxed, and you think about tax rates raise, uh, running from 10% to 39.6% today, if you would have been taxed at the 39.6% on that $1,000, you save $396. If you would have been taxed at the 10% rate, you save only $100. And if that premium had added, been added to your income, but your income is so modest, you wouldn't have been taxed anyway. You save nothing. So that's the, that's the dollars and cents. But employers typically provide, as you know, much larger policies for uh, the executives, for top management. 
I wrote an op-ed some years ago about Goldman Sachs. It provided premiums of $40,000 a year. I think if they felt they were going to sneeze, they were covered. $40,000 a year for their top 400 managers. These are the top income earners in the world, among the top. And they each saved at the time roughly $14,000 a year in taxes, which was the cost of a basic policy, essentially the government giving them a basic policy through this exclusion. Now this also produces a, a concept that I think is really important of double losers. Who are the double losers here? Well, these are employees who work for companies, and millions of Americans do, who don't provide any health insurance at work. They're too, they make a little too much money to get Medicaid, and they have to go out in the marketplace and buy their health insurance. But because the huge exclusion for health insurance drives up the price of health insurance and the cost of all health care, they have to pay more for all of that because others get the benefit of this enormous exclusion. Now, the Affordable Care Act has helped, but it's only tempered this outcome. So here are a couple of policy questions I leave with you. Why should the government provide the greatest tax savings for health insurance premiums for the people with the highest incomes who could afford to buy those policies without any government assistance. Secondly, why should the government ever subsidize a health insurance policy other than a basic one? So now let me turn to the second, the most sacred deduction, and you all know it, and you know that it's in the Constitution. It must be the home mortgage interest deduction. Somewhere in the Second Amendment, it must be there. <clears throat> now, the home mortgage interest deduction allows people to deduct the interest on up to $1 million of loans to buy a principal or build a principal residence and or a vacation home. So you could borrow $650,000 to uh, buy your principal residence, $350,000 to buy a vacation home and deduct all the interest on that. Now, the public is encouraged to believe that the home mortgage interest deduction is absolutely essential to increase the number of homeowners, particularly ordinary homeowners, and that it strengthens the economy. But as in the Wizard of Oz, let's peek behind the rhetorical curtain and really look at this decision, which is really the third rail in Congress. They won't touch it. Now, the deduction is expected to save certain taxpayers over the next five years $400 billion. That's a big program. So let's imagine, I know that you all have imagination, that's why you're here, that Congress eliminated the mortgage interest deduction. Oh, you can't hear, though. That's awful. So, imagine I'm over there. Um, <laughs> that it eliminated the deduction, but it authorized HUD, Housing and Urban Development, to issue $400 billion of checks tax-free to all the people who would have got the deduction in exactly the same amount of their tax savings. So they end up in the same position the government is out $400 billion. And imagine that it's a Monday morning, in fact, this morning, and I'm the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, something I've always wanted to be. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you how proud we are for the distribution of that $400 billion. And down the middle of there will be the bottom half of all taxpayers. I apologize, but you on the right, you're the top half of all taxpayers. And the Five of you, including Mr. Freeman, you're included. You're in the top 5%. And the students in the top 5% always smile. You can see it. And the people over here always look grim. In any event, here's how the $400 billion is allocated. I'm really happy to tell you. 2% goes to the bottom half of all taxpayers. You get $8 billion. The other $392 billion goes to the top half of all taxpayers. And to you, five. And he's putting up his, his thumb. To you, f top 5%, you get 40% or $160 billion over the next five years so you can buy and build that house of your, of your pleasure. That's 20 times what the bottom half of all taxpayers get. Now, if this were on television, you would think maybe it's Saturday Night Live. But it isn't. That's exactly how approximately how that $400 billion will be distributed over the next five years. And it has real repercussions. First of all, there's the myth that it creates more homeowners. In fact, England, Canada, and Australia have 
no home, mor home mortgage interest deduction, nothing like it. And they have the same, roughly the same ownership of homes as we do. In fact, some have, have a higher percentage. Secondly, it mainly helps people buy and build bigger homes than they would do otherwise, not a basic home. It drives up the prices of home. This is no freebie. You know if you lost your home mortgage interest deduction that the price of your home would go down. So you're paying for it. It, it, isn't, it isn't free money. And most interesting, both liberal and conservative economists say that our economy would be stronger, not weaker, if less of our capital were allocated to home ownership, particularly expensive homes, so that more capital would be available at lower interest rates to new businesses, to existing businesses, to expand, to add jobs, etc. Now, who might be the double losers? Well, how about renters? Now, there's not a lot of research on this, but just think of the common sense. If so much capital is allocated to home ownership, then less capital presumably is allocated to apartments, to places that you can rent. Now, renters absolutely have much less income than homeowners, on average. So they effectively have to pay higher rent than they would otherwise pay because of these huge subsidies for homeowners who have much more income to begin with to pay for their, 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 their uh, housing costs. So as Mr. Freeman says, what should Congress do? Um, well, the leading tax commissions under the Bush administration and under the Obama administration have concluded that we should reduce many of them, eliminate the really inefficient ones, the unfair ones, um, and, and expose more income to tax and make more sense out of all this. You know what happened. Congress ignored it. But as Mr. Freeman said, they, a, a fair and sensible income tax is worth fighting for. Such reforms should be done over time, so not to totally disrupt the economy. But if Congress moved in that direction, more people would pay in accordance with their ability to pay. And they would save and work and invest in ways that produce the greatest economic return rather than focusing on their tax savings. And assuming the government, and there's some things that should be in the tax laws, so the earned income tax credit is a, is, a, is a wonderful example. So assuming that some social and economic provisions ought to be in the tax laws, let's think about tax credits. Every dollar of tax credit saves you one dollar. It doesn't matter what your marginal tax bracket is. So if you owe $1,000 and you get a $1,000 tax credit, you don't owe anything. If you owe a million dollars, you owe a million minus $1,000. Now, the tax credits also should be refundable in many cases where they are social uh, programs. Because a refundable tax credit, like the earned income tax credit, which says that people who are working but don't earn a living wage are going to get extra money to help them have a living wage. And so if you make it refundable, if you don't owe the income tax, you'll get a direct grant. Uh, both commissions uh, said that about the home mortgage interest deduction, replace it by a credit. And Congress ignored that. Finally, you might have the largest credits for people who need the help most and the least credits for people who need the help least. So this is how I end my talk with the students and I end it with you. I say to them, I hope that some of you are brave enough if you're at a political rally, and I hope you go to the political rallies, and you hear a politician say, I'm going to propose a new deduction to help ordinary workers, you hardworking workers, that you'll raise your hand. And you'll say, why are you proposing a tax break that saves the most money for people with the highest income who need the assistance least, and the least tax savings for people with low and moderate incomes who need the assistance most. Thank you very much. All right, to introduce our next speaker, I believe Mr. Nader will be returning. Is that right? Thank you, uh, John Fox. In fact, we have copies of your 10 questions that politicians don't want to answer. We can uh, give them out, especially to the Hood College students 
who have arrived. And, uh, and, and are, are going to demonstrate they have the highest attention span of all college students in the country today. No smartphones. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Joan Claybrook, who has worked on the Congress uh, for almost 50 years. The Congress is the most powerful instrument of our democracy to transform our country. Just look at the power it has in the Constitution, the power to tax, the power to spend, the power of oversight and investigation, uh, the power to confirm nominations for the courts and high executive branch officials, and many other powers. They also have the eye of the media, and that's why we all have to pay attention to the Congress. It does spend about 22 percent of our income, and what it does and doesn't do can either ennoble the country or get the country in a lot of trouble, like the criminal invasion of Iraq, which the Congress punted to the White House in 2003. The people are supposed to be sovereign. Uh, the Constitution starts with we the people, not we the Congress or we the corporation. And yet, 1,500 or so corporations, give or take, pretty much control a majority of the Congress on many issues that affect everybody, health, safety, economic well-being, environment. And so there's this gap between the constant pressure by thousands of lobbyists on Capitol Hill every day and uh, the withdrawal of most of the people in this country from holding their members of Congress accountable. There are only 535 of them. 100 senators, 435 members of the House. They put their shoes on every day, like you and I. And uh, as Warren Buffett once said, we're 300 million people. How come we can't control 535 uh, elected politicians? Now, the, the, uh, what Joan has done, and she's going to demonstrate this, is uh, show how a citizen lobbyist uh, can go up on Capitol Hill and get things done. What does the citizen lobbyist, environmental, consumer, labor, whatever, what do they bring to senators and representatives? They bring a set of facts documenting perils or corruption or what have you. They bring uh, their own determination and creativity and strategy. They bring uh, a reflection of public opinion, uh, majority of public opinion like safe cars. They like clean air. They like clean water, sort of a left-right lung issue, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and, um, and, and they bring the ability to selectively pick your allies where they are in Congress in strategic committee locations and so forth to get a foothold. So what are these citizen groups up against? They're up against corporations who have far more lobbyists, outnumbering the citizen lobbyists. The drug companies at one time when they were pushing the drug benefit bill had 450 full-time lobbyists going up on Capitol Hill. 450. And that's only the drug industry. Uh, they have a lot of money. They pour it into PACs. They have a lot of persistence. Uh, their job depends on their success uh, in, in Congress. They have their own specialized media like the, the Chamber of, of Congress, uh, and they are able to offer jobs to uh, congressional staff or members of Congress after they leave the Congress, which is a very uh, little appreciated tool uh, that they have. Now, you're going to hear uh, how one citizen lobbyist uh, actually dealt with this mountain of opposition and on more than a few occasions, prevailed. She was the longtime president of Public Citizen. Before that, she ran Public Citizen's Congress Watch. She did work on Capitol Hill. Uh, but when she goes up on Capitol Hill, uh, equipped with those items that I just mentioned, um, senators from both sides have a hard time ignoring her. So I want to introduce what the auto companies once called the Dragon Lady. Joan Claybrook.
Well, I think we've heard his, the talk, and I think I could go home now, haven't we? <laughs> um, so uh, th it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, this is a great conference. It's uh, extremely important to assemble uh, citizen organizers and citizen leaders to talk about what they do, what they've learned, and to convey it as broadly as possible. So I'm going to talk about the Congress, uh, which uh, everyone is quite uh, uh, awed by. And I'm going to give you a list of 10 principles for getting bills enacted, 10 principles, and then give you a few examples of how we use them. Of course, giving millions of dollars in campaign money or hiring reams of high-priced lobbyists is not a strategy option for the public interest groups. Uh, indeed, business entities spend billions on lobbying Congress every year. It's amazing how often citizen groups knock win and knock down legislative battles against this. And uh, <clears throat> Ralph mentioned that uh, one of the strategies is hiring congressional staff or members of Congress when they leave their posts, when they're ready to make money and do something different. And sometimes uh, they hire the former chief of staff of a particular member who is a chairman of a committee, let's say the Ways and Means Committee, a very important committee, uh, so that they can just, they spend $20,000 a month hiring that person so that they can influence that member on one particular bill. That's how much money they spend. Well, when I came to Washington from Baltimore a number of years ago on a fellowship in Congress, I was scared to death. Uh, a, a member of Congress was, had me awestruck. And then a friend suggested that when I met the first member of Congress, that I envisioned him, and most of them were men at the time, in long, long red underwear with a top uh, silk hat. Well, that was very helpful, more than you can imagine. My first interview was with Morris Udall. He was six feet six, and he looked like Abraham Lincoln. And the red outfit immediately popped into my mind when I met him, and I thought, oh my God, and I giggled, and it relaxed me, and then I was on my way. Never again was I awestruck by a member of Congress. It's a great technique. Uh, citizens should not be intimidated by high-level officials, ever. Remember, they work for us. In fact, uh, members are very sensitive to pressure, particularly members of Congress, and uh, they always want to be liked. Never forget that, because if you get angry with them, the next thing you know is that they're going to come back and want to make friends with you again, so don't worry about it. Uh, and don't forget that the U.S. Constitution gives us explicit authority in the First Amendment to petition the government for redress of grievances. We are, in, in, in fact, carrying out the Constitution. So ten principles. First is to divide and conquer and then organize, organize, organize. Don't be overwhelmed by 435 members of the House or 100 of the Senate. Ralph's already put it in perspective uh, with 300 million Americans. Why can't we control them? But it's also important when you're actually doing the work to remember that the Congress has many subparts. They have committees, they have subcommittees, they have leadership groups, they have state and issue caucuses, and that's where the real work occurs. So rather than having to worry about 435 members of Congress, you really only have to worry about 40 or 50, because those are the ones that are going to make the decision on your bill. Uh, and that's very doable. Second of all, second principle, find a leader. You need a leader, uh, a member of Congress in each house who's a skilled legislator and serves on the committee of jurisdiction over the proposed bill. And preferably you want a bipartisan group, leaders. A strong leader makes the difference between winning and losing. Work with your leader to draft the bill with help from Congressional Legislative Council that he will arrange or she will arrange. Help the leaders achieve their goals and yours, and that always includes getting media. So leaders are really critical. Third, know the rules governing your legislation. The Congress has many rules, just like the courts have their own rules. Um, you and your leader must know the pertinent rules that will decide the outcome of the bill. And I won't go into all the details, but there are lots of rules. Work Fourth, work closely with the congressional staff while always connecting with the member. The staff are critical because um, they can facilitate your work uh, by telling you what's going on inside Congress, they often hear first what's happening on your legislation. They hear of emerging opposition, and you always want to pay attention to your opposition. They will hear about uh, possible hearings or floor action or key rules. Um, they can help build and support other congressional staff offices. And the, so the staff are really the gatekeepers for the members. 
you need their support. When I say you, I mean you as a group, not you as an individual. I think Ralph Nader is the only person who by himself got a bill enacted into law. That was 50 years ago. So you need to have a group. You need to, have an, you need to organize. Five, you need to prepare materials to support your bill. You need to argue why you want this piece of legislation. You've got to make sure they're 100% accurate, concise, interesting, and designed to persuade with graphs and pictures if pertinent. Different documents must be prepared for congressional offices, for the media, and for coalition groups because uh, you want to build a coalition. That is how you get legislation through from the consumer perspective. They must include data and research with sources listed at least in at least one of your documents. You can get information from the internet, from libraries, from the congressional record, from Freedom of Information Act requests to government agencies, from free government publications, university professors, other public interest experts, the Government Accountability Office, and so on. So there are lots of sources for you to get your information, and by the way, also from the industry that's relevant to what you're talking about. But the bottom line is a one-page summary. A one-page summary is dynamite. A member of Congress, you hand them one sheet of paper, they take the piece of paper, they fold it like this, they fold it like this, and they put it in their pocket. Now, where would you want to be with your information and your member, that member of Congress? You want to be on his inside pocket. So always remember, give him a very concise material. Six, develop as broad a coalition as possible to advocate for the bill. Join with consumer groups and victim groups. Labor entities, strange bed bedfellows such as uh, individual businesses or business groups that sometimes break off from the, the rest of them. Prominent individuals, other nonprofits, groups concerned with the substance of your bill, for example, it's an environmental bill, all the environmental organizations, uh, citizens uh, from the congressional district with maximum uh, organizing and minimum procedure for participating. Seven, find and involve victims of the harm that you're trying to remedy, focusing particularly on victims from your, your leader's district and from those of members who oppose the legislation. If you bring in a victim from, and, and have it presented to somebody who's opposed the legislation, they kind of melt. And that's what you want to do. You want to melt your opposition. Eight, media coverage of your bill or your issue is critical to your legislative success. You want to get the media to tell people about it. The broader circulation, the better, i.e. the New York Times or the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal, AP, television networks, but these are hard to achieve. But there are also thousands of other media outlets from regional dailies to Politico to 24-hour television and radio news, social media on the internet and so on. And to get the media to pay attention, you need to tell a sympathetic story. Mm -hmm.